introduce Lana. And Lana has her own bio, but I'm going to talk about something different at the beginning of the year. I met Lana virtually at the Linux Conf Australia conference. We were both doing talks. We were the only documentarians there at Linux Conf Australia. We love Linux. We love write, write the talks. We bonded. Uh, and and I heard her talk. I thought it was great uh, when I took responsibility for setting up this uh, this particular quorum meetup. I asked her to reprise her talk. She said, no, Mike, I have a better idea. I listened and I thought, wow, this, this sounds wonderful. And if you've seen the title of the talk, More Than Words, yes, it comes from the, uh, from the song from Extreme. So from the lyrics, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to sing it. More than words is all you have to do to make it real. And with that, welcome Lana. Yes, excellent. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the Bunjalung land on which I'm giving this presentation today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge that this land which I benefit from occupying was stolen and that sovereignty was never ceded by the Bunjalung people. So with that, Done. I'm going to start with a bit of a humble brag, and I know that my bio that, uh, that Mike just showed said that I live in Brisbane, but I just moved to Australia's Gold Coast. Now, you might remember the Gold Coast from when Tom Hanks got COVID-19 about four million years ago. I live near there. So we've moved to a relatively nice area with a huge amount of development going on. And most of these development sites have advertising up and around the construction, enticing people to come and buy an apartment or two. Some reason there we go. Uh, so these developments all have a few things in common. They all have a stupid aspirational name like Esperance or Esfina. Uh, this one is Delta, which I'm sure they're regretting now. Um, but they all say, also say something about architecture. So uh, one says architecturally designed. Another one says the best elements of architectural design. Uh, this one that I ran out and took a photo of last week says architect design home to suit your lifestyle. So I'd like to have a little think about what architecture means in this sense. Clearly, the developers of these properties are relying on you thinking that having an architect design your home makes it a bit fancier. When in reality, most of these projects are apartment buildings and I've lived in a few apartment buildings and I can tell you they're just tiny boxes stacked on top of one another. But if we dig past the marketing words, we know that an architect is the person who designs the building. They don't choose the location, go out and buy the materials or do any kind of building, plumbing or electrical work. They don't choose which furniture to put in the home, what the kitchen cabinets look like, or pick the carpet. They are purely about design. They're picking the shape of the house, the layout of the rooms, making sure it suits the area it's in and the people who live in it, and hopefully getting a spot on Grand Designs or a show, something like that. So can you have a home that hasn't had an architect? Well, one of my guiltier pleasures on the internet is to browse bad real estate photos. And the way I see it is that these are the result of homes that haven't had the benefit of an architect. Or maybe the architect was involved so many renovations ago that they probably wore mission brown flares and had a peace sign necklace. But in most of these atrocities, you'll notice that the fixtures and fittings are often quite nice, like this perfectly reasonable bathtub or this quite lovely chandelier. The thing that's gone wrong is not the construction or the furniture or anything like that, it's the design. So to bring this around the long way to documentation, you can think of the words you write as being a little bit like these kitchen drawers. Perfectly good wood cabinetry and nice chrome handles. If only they designed them in such a way that people could actually use them. And that's what this talk is really about. I know you already know how to write great words in the best order. I'm certain you can craft a procedure that makes grown adults weep with its elegant simplicity. And I just know that you can come up with the perfect title for every manual every single time. But none of that matters if you don't have an architect involved. 
if you're starting from a completely blank slate, then lucky you can probably skip this step. But I'm betting that most of you already have something written down. Whether it's new content or older than time itself, the best way to work out what you need is to make a critical assessment of what you already have. Even if what you have is the carpeted toilet of technical documentation. This works equally well if you are new to the content and need to wrap your head around it, or if you're a bit too familiar with it and you need to try and see it with fresh eyes. The best way I've found to start with a long, hard look at your content is to create a content map. Now, how you do this depends largely on how much content you have. If you have a few hundred pages or if you don't want to go too deep into your hierarchy, then you can probably just create a table in your document. If you have, say, a giant wiki, uh, that you're trying to categorize and maybe start with a spreadsheet. You could potentially go the whole hog and set up a database if you really want to spend time on this, but in most cases that would probably just be overkill. So this is a content map I did when I started my current job. This is just the first page. And if we zoom in here, you can see I've only looked at the top three levels of the hierarchy, at least partly because that's where the bulk of the content was. So in my table, I have the top level, second level, and third level or page title. I've included a URL to the page and just the general content type of that page. Now, I'm going to come back to content types in a minute, um, and that's partly at least why we, uh, we had the little poll before. For now, though, you can already start to see patterns to form. If we zoom out, now I appreciate this is blurry and you're not going to be able to see it, but we're looking at the shape of things a little bit here. So you can see I've got one huge top level bucket that contains most of the content. And while the second level headings are a little bit more evenly spaced, there's still one that's much bigger than the others. Uh, you can also see the smaller top level headings don't have a second level heading down on the bottom there. And most of the content sits higher in the hierarchy than they do in our big top bucket. So that's something we'll definitely need to come back and look at. So you can already start to see some patterns emerging at this point. Now, content types are something that probably most of you have come across, and I was very pleased to see that about 50% of you prefer DITA over any of the others. DITA, D-I-T-A, I know that my accent makes that sound a bit funny. Um, so there are several different ways of categorizing content. I'm going to run through data and that's mostly, it's my favorite mostly because it's the simplest to understand and it's the simplest to explain. So basically there are three different content types, concepts, task and reference. Uh, if the content answers the question, what is it, then it's a concept. Concepts are usually prose paragraphs that explain what something is or how something works. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. I'm hoping most of you have seen this before. So if the content answers the question, how do I do it, then it's a task. These are usually numbered steps in the form of procedures. And this is, as a tech writer, our bread and butter. We do these all day long. And then if it answers the question, what else do I need to know, then it's a reference. Uh, this is usually a table or a list of things that you can look up to find out information, such as what a particular command does or a list of options. So hopefully that's all pretty clear for everyone. Now, good documentation should have clearly defined sections of concepts, followed by tasks, followed by reference. And you can start to see at a glance now where my biggest issue was in my content map earlier. Most of the content I had was mixed concepts and tasks. Uh, it had concepts interwoven with tasks, tasks followed by more tasks without any concepts at all, and very little reference content. So this is basically a red flag. Beginners need lots of concepts and experienced users need to be able to skip the concepts and easily locate tasks and reference information. When it gets all mixed up like that, it basically makes it difficult for everyone. So, now that you have a content map drawn up and you can already start to see some of these initial patterns and problems, you need to turn around from your content and have a look at what's on the other side, which is your readers. The first thing to do is to really think hard about who is reading your docs. The simple answer to this is quote unquote our users, but that's actually a bit of a cop out. There's a reason that most technical writers use the term readers rather than users for the people who use the product we create. 
It's because users use software and readers read documentation. And while that Venn diagram overlaps, it's not a perfect circle. Your readers are not always, or sometimes not even mainly, your users. Depending on your product, you may find that sales and support staff use your docs more than end users do. Uh, that's the case in a lot of really professional contexts. In the open source world, you probably find that people read your docs to determine if they want to be involved in your community, if they want to use your product in their own project, or if they might want to fork your project for some reason. These readers cannot necessarily be considered users, and it's important that we write documentation that's appropriate for them as well. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. No one curls up at night with a warm drink and a great technical manual. And if that's the case, why do people read documentation? Generally speaking, it's because they want to achieve something. To put that in less abstract terms, you need to work out what problem your reader is trying to solve. So there's a common quote that says something like, uh, people don't buy a drill because they need a drill, they buy a drill because they need a hole. Uh, when it comes to documentation though, you actually need to go a step further and ask why they need the hole. So let's say my friend Alex is at the local hardware store looking at drills. What kind of advice would help Alex here? There's a pretty good chance that when Alex woke up this morning, they didn't think, you know what, I don't have a drill. I should go out to the hardware store today and buy one. What's more likely is that they woke up this morning and thought something like, oh, I should hang that picture on my wall or I should install a bed over the staircase. So the content that Alex needs is probably not called how to choose a drill. The documentation they need is something more like how to install beds in unconventional places. So this is a really important distinction because if you get it wrong, your readers won't know that the content is for them or worse, they won't find your content at all. Now, it's really easy to sit around and have a think about who your readers might be, but it's even better if you can go out and find out for real. This isn't always going to be an option for you, depending on how much time you have available for research and I guess COVID restrictions in your area. So I would definitely recommend that you do as much of this as you possibly can, but don't beat yourself up if you simply don't have the bandwidth to do it all. The main thing is to try and get in contact with your readers in any way you can. My preferred method is to start with a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with people you already know. If you have a community around your product um, or, or around your company, you can usually, usually reach out to your top contributors and users fairly easily. If you're in a larger corporate environment, I would start with sales, technical account managers and consulting staff. You can then use the information you get from those interviews to create a short survey to send out to your wider audience if that's an option that's available to you. And I would recommend to use the same survey questions and run that survey once a year or so as well, just to be able to gather that data. So the benefits of doing this, this actually serves a few different purposes. The first reason is that you get direct feedback on your current documentation. There's a good chance that you'll find out some truths about your docs, but it's even more likely that you'll have your suspicions confirmed. So this is great because now you're not just working on your gut feel, you have actual data to back up why you're making changes and you have a much better story to tell about the improvements you want to make. The second reason is a little bit more long-term. You might not get any advantage straight away, but in the weeks and months to come, when someone notices a problem with a document, they're more likely to think, oh, hold on, someone was asking about this recently, who was that? So it actually builds engagement for you in the long term as well. It's also really important to understand what your readers actually want, rather than what you think they might want. In my previous role, the developers kept telling us that we needed more quick start information, but when we asked our readers, they all said they wanted more explanations of how things worked, not just step-by-step -step procedures. So both of those are about getting started, sure, but in terms of the content we needed to write, it was quite different. By the same token, you also need to find out if readers actually want what they say they want. One piece of feedback I once got from a reader was to stop moving things around. And this was really interesting to me because when I dug a little deeper into the problem, it turned out that people found the documentation so difficult to navigate, they were saving hard links to the content they needed. So if we moved things, those links broke. 
the problem was not so much that we were moving things around, but that they couldn't find the stuff they needed in the first place. So in the end, the solution to that was to improve the navigability of the site, to implement a really good site search mechanism and to get more consistency in our section headings and procedure titles. So in the end, the, the fix to stop moving things around was to move things around a little bit more. A lot of technical writers like to do a user task analysis to work out what content needs to be prioritized. Uh, you can spend a lot of time on these to do them properly, but you don't really need to go into too much detail. It's really just a way to validate what you probably already have in your head by now. Uh, so to do this, you need to have an idea of who your readers are and the things your readers want to describe. The lists don't need to be exhaustive, but you should be able to group most of them into some broad categories that cover the spectrum of readers and tasks. So if we look at the reader types first, the way you categorize your readers is entirely up to you. But sometimes the best way to start is to think of a beginner, an intermediate reader, and an expert. Or, depending on the kind of product you have, you might think of, say, an ordinary user, a system administrator, and a support person. Your three readers should probably be interested in different parts of your product. They'll be trying to do different tasks and they will need different levels of help from the documentation. Don't be afraid to let them overlap a little bit, but try and make sure you've covered at least most of the options. So in the example I'm going to show you on the next slide, I'm using system admin sales and support, but you could easily include developers, hobbyists, executives, or any number of others. So moving on to what readers want to achieve. For each of your readers, start by thinking about how they might begin. What's the very first thing they might want to do? Assume they manage to complete that without any trouble. What's the second thing? And then if they manage to complete that, what's the next thing? Again, you don't need to be exhaustive here, but make sure you cover the big ticket items, things like installing, troubleshooting, that kind of thing. So once you have those things, you can put them in a little table like this and work out how likely it is the particular reader will use the documentation to do each task. If you put the reader types across the top of your table and all of the tasks down the side, you get a great matrix that looks something like this. Now, obviously this is only the first few lines. I would have probably a lot more tasks on there, but hopefully this is enough to give you an idea. You fill out each square on the table with the likelihood that each reader type will use the docs to do each task. Now, the really important thing here, you're not asking if system administrators are likely to do a product installation, because of course they are. You're asking if system administrators are likely to use the documentation to do a product installation. The answer to that is trickier, and it depends on how easy your product is to install, how often a system admin does that task, and a range of other things. So, when you have all the boxes filled out, you can do some simple maths and score a three for high likelihood, two for medium, one for low likelihood. And this gives each task a score. The higher the number, the more critical the documentation for this task is. So in my example here, you can see that product research scores a six because it's really only important to one group, but managing clients, client systems scores a nine because it's important to everyone. So that means we know to spend more time and effort on documenting how to manage clients. And we can improve the general product info later on. So the highest scoring things in your table are called the critical paths. The items with the highest critical path score is the content that is most important for you to write. All this doesn't mean the lower ranked things aren't important, of course, but it, this is just about giving you a place to focus. If you find that your focus points are not adequately covered in your existing docs, then you have an immediate start point. So by now, you know what content you have, and you have a pretty good idea of who your readers are and the kind of content they need. Now you can take a look at the structure of the docs and work out if the way things are organized now matches what it is that your readers want. So generally speaking, humans have a tendency to put things in hierarchies. So you will probably be facing a documentation suite that looks a little bit like this. Unfortunately, hierarchies work well for when we have a bunch of content and we need to organize it, but they don't actually work very well for when we need something. To demonstrate, think about when you last moved house. I have just done this recently, as I mentioned earlier, and I can tell you that what I did when I got to the new place was to start unpacking boxes and boxes of stuff. So I'd pick up one thing and put it somewhere that seemed reasonable, and then days later I'd wander around wondering where I put it. 
I ended up worming, we have two cats, and I ended up worming our two cats a full week late last month because I found one cat's medicine in one place and the other cat's medicine somewhere entirely different after three days of searching. So putting things in a reasonable place is a very different skill and uses a different part of your brain to finding things. To get this back to documentation, you need to think about the different methods people use to find your content. Are they coming to you directly by typing docs.yourcompany.com into their browser? Are they searching your company docs or maybe how do I install the thing or even what is the thing? When they reach your page, what page are they landing on? The top level page of your hierarchy or some page deep in the content? And then perhaps the most important question, where do they go next? Do they search for something else on your site? Do they use a navigation menu to click on something else? Or do they get bored and click away to Facebook? One of the most important things I noticed when I was analyzing the documentation at timescale was that we had several methods of navigating the docs, but they all relied on readers already knowing what they were looking for. Now, this would be fine if we were catering only to experienced readers, but we knew from research that we also had a lot of brand new beginner readers and we had a lot of content that was tailored to beginner readers as well, a lot of tutorials and getting started information. So we needed to make sure that people were actually able to find things. Because our product has quite a few unique terms for features, it was doubly important that we didn't just assume that readers knew what those terms were or what they meant. We needed to develop a way of navigating that not only allowed people to find content they knew they needed, but that could lead them to content they didn't know they needed. Basically, we wanted to take readers from a place of understanding or I need to know how to do this thing to a place of discovery or I didn't know it could also do this other thing. This is a really important step because often readers know what they want to achieve but they don't know the words to describe the thing or they use different words to what we might use internally. So from here, I get to a step that I like to categorize as using your thinking brain. Hopefully the analysis you've done so far has led you to some natural conclusions that are now just waiting for you to express them fully. But if you haven't and you're just more confused than ever, you can start methodically working through some ideas. Uh, how do you need to arrange your content to make it easier for your readers to achieve their goals? What technologies do you have available in terms of automation and organization? In my current role, we decided to significantly flatten our hierarchy and implement some intelligence in the form of keywords and related content. Whatever your thinking brain has come up with, it's time to write all of your brilliant ideas down. Even if they're incredibly unrealistic, write them down anyway. We'll work on cutting them down to size in the next step. So this is what I like to call an implementation plan, and it's where reality settles back in and we decide what's actually feasible and in what time frame. This is the point where it's really important that you have some management buy-in on your overall plan. So you might want to make sure you've shopped your initial research around the company a little bit before you get started, so this doesn't all come out of the blue for your manager. The first thing to do is to work out what resources you have. That's people, time, and money. And these work in the form of a project management constraint triangle. Um, hopefully you've all seen something similar to this in the past. So if you don't have much time, you'll need more people to do the work, more money to cover things like outsourced contractors or ready-made software tools. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you can compensate by having more people to do the work and expecting it to take longer. And if you don't have a lot of people, you'll need more time and money. The next step is to determine what your minimum viable product is. That's your starting point. The smallest piece of work that can be done to achieve some benefit. In most IA projects, this is usually a small reorganization of existing content or adding a small feature such as site search. From there, you can work out what the next level items are. More features, more automation, better metadata for SEO, improved content, right up to complete rewrites, tool or language conversions, and completely new content. Now that you now you get to pick the things on the list that you can do within your constraints. So as a side note, it's okay to be a little bit disappointed at this stage. 
it's very normal to have spent a bunch of time doing the research, realizing exactly how much better it could be, researching the amazing things you could do to make it better, only to have it come crashing back to reality when you realize you can't possibly make it all happen. Mind you, from personal experience, I can tell you that if you do out of the blue get approval to implement everything you suggest, after that initial rush, you have to face the fact that you're about to embark on a massive project and that can be incredibly overwhelming as well. So maybe there are no winners in this game. So now that you have your implementation plan, I hate to say it, but you've got to do the hard yards and do the work. Now I have other talks on how to manage big projects like this, so I won't go into that kind of detail here. If you are interested in reading or in watching one of my talks about project management, scan that QR code, it should take you to a YouTube link. Let's give everyone a couple of seconds. They want to get their phone out. I've got another QR code later on as well, so keep it out. Okay. One final note that I want to make about this process is that it's important to measure your success. This starts right from the beginning. If you have done your planning properly, including things like your content analysis, then you have a good starting point for later on being able to measure how things have changed. It's also a great idea if you have the ability to start collecting data wherever possible, especially if you can start before you implement any changes. That gives you a baseline for measuring change. So for example, if you define early on that one of your measures of success is going to be improving dwell time on each page, you need to know what your average dwell time was before you started so you can measure the improvement after your changes. And a final caveat is that you might need to be prepared to have your ideas challenged. It's entirely possible that even after all this research and planning, you implement a new design and it just sucks. Design and architecture is more art than science after all. This building won an architecture award and sometimes you can try a thing out and it just doesn't fit. In that case, the most important thing you can do is listen to what your readers are telling you, either directly through feedback or indirectly through their actions on your site. Tweak things, roll things back if you have to, adjust as you go, and keep gathering data. Unlike buildings, documentation architecture is constantly a work in progress. And that brings us to the end. I just wanted to say that I work for an awesome company that lets me work on really cool stuff like this. So if that's something that sounds like it might be interesting to you, then you're in luck because we're hiring. Uh, we are also at the moment looking for a, a, a documentation engineer type person. So a front end developer who understands technical running and can help me actually implement a whole lot of my big ideas. And I'd love to have one of, one of my Write the Docs colleagues join me there. Uh, so on that note, thanks for listening, be kind to each other, and I'll catch you in the Q&A afterwards, I guess. I think that was wonderful. Let's see. Yep, I'm off mute. I've been watching the uh, uh, the chat for questions, and I, th I think most of the uh, comments were based on broken links. I'm not so sure that's that's relevant. So I'm go going to start off the question and answer with uh, with some, some of my own. It, it sounds like what but you've done some of this with with time scale and it, it looks like a heck of a lot of work. Give us an idea of of the scope time wise. How long did it take? Did you? Was it just you, or did you have uh, have people helping you? So the time scale situation is quite interesting. It's a late stage startup, and I am the only documentation person. And being a startup, there's a whole lot of people there who are relatively new in their careers, which is awesome because they have a huge amount of enthusiasm and I love working with them, but it also means not a lot of them have experience working with technical writers in the past. So I'm doing a whole lot of education and helping people along on the journey with me. Now, if you go and look at the docs.timescale site, you will note that I have not implemented everything that I've talked about here. Um, we do still have a hierarchy that is still in place. But what we're doing in the back end is adding a whole lot of metadata to make our related content and all that kind of stuff work. Uh, so while we've implemented related content, we've implemented uh, the tag keyword navigation and that kind of thing. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happening in the back end to make things work a little bit more. And then we'll actually make those, those big changes later on. So we're not complete yet. Um, well, I've been working on it for three or four months, but I've also been the sole technical writer at the company during that time, so it's not the only thing I'm working on. So, uh, so stay tuned for the for the result of that one. 
Great. I think we have one, one person who's raised his hand. Uh, I hope I get this right. Sabahat, uh, welcome to ask a question. Thank you. So I had a, a sort of a comment and I, you know, I had great respect for the way Lana laid this out. And, you know, I, in the beginning, I was like, yep, yep, yep. You know, when you were talking about the types of users, but then you came up with that uh, rubric for numbers and how to give it. And, and that was amazing. That was wonderful. I just wanted to do a semi question slash type of user thing because I spent a lot of time working with semiconductor firms. And for them, we realized our users were actually not even, it wasn't so much early, it, it was a product life cycle breakup, not a use breakup. So, you know, with microchips, there's going to be one type of user who makes the decision, basically from, through the company, you'd have different types of users. So there's the CTO, you know, when we try to sell a product, the CTO looks at just the conceptual level of the product and says, yes, it fits what we want to do. Then it goes to their tech designer person who looks at, does this chip have the inputs and the outputs we will need and all of that. Then there is the level of the person programming and then the person trying to design that chip into the hardware. So there's four different types of users. And with any chip we found, you know, if it's not a complicated chip, it's going to be one book with all of those parts. And then we have to make sure which chapter goes in which section. And if it's separate, it could either be parts of a book or it could be four books. And then we know which type of user is reading which book or which section. That's the question I have is, have you worked in or have you seen any resources that have done some more thinking about this with respect to other tech industries or other industries or other ways to look at that user breakdown? Uh, there's plenty of resources for user task analysis. I would always start with John Haykos. Um, in terms of other industries and that, I feel as though it's fairly adaptable across industries, but having been based mostly in software, I haven't personally experienced that. I feel like it probably would adapt fairly well though. I can't see why there would be any major, especially from the description you've just given me, I don't see that there would be any major differences in how you would apply it to, in, in hardware to software, to be honest. Right, the rubric seems very interesting. That was, that was amazing. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to count on Alicia to stop me, but uh, does anybody else have, uh, have questions? I don't there, see. There were a couple in the chat. Okay. Uh, um, they were a little, um, okay, so I'll ask the first one, which is I work at a data center and we have started transitioning into using Microsoft OneNote instead of just Word and Excel docs. Any tips? I have not used OneNote, I'm sorry. <laughs> No I can't worries. help you on that one. <laughs> I, that's how I I'm felt. Sorry. I like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Docs's code is awesome. Please explore it. Hey, yeah. The best I've got. <laughs> um, next one. Uh, how do you accelerate your learning when someone wants to use an unfamiliar doc documentation technology? Uh, so how do you accelerate learning? Sorry, Michelle. Um, how do you accelerate learning about something new? Is that what you're asking? For a new documentation technology, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm a fairly immersive learner. So I just sort of go all in, jump feet in and start reading everything I can and doing a proof of concept installation on my local machine usually. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't have a huge amount to say on that one. Okay, I think you'll like Tina's question. Um, hi, Tina. Um, have you encountered a project where a different approach to IA, meaning information architecture, was more appropriate, such as information mapping? Information mapping goes against the grain and actively mi mixes different content types in a strict order. That is a brilliant question. I have not used information mapping, um, but I appreciate that, yeah, it does really turn everything on its head. And I think, at least my, my hunch would be that if you are doing something like a wiki uh, that has a lot of really disparate and disconnected parts and information mapping would probably work better. And it probably even fits better into um, saying every page is page one methodology as well, which I'm a huge fan of, but I find very difficult to, to, uh, to implement in the kinds of documentation I've been working on. But yeah, I haven't done information mapping, but I appreciate that it is quite different as well. So yeah, I think there are definitely places that it would be more appropriate. 
looks like, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I'm also working at a startup and was tasked with writing our docs from scratch. My job title is also not technical writer, so I'm quite, quite new to this. Do you have any tips? Sorry, just um, disappeared for me. Tips for structuring docs so that they are easier to keep up to date with a rapidly changing product and limited resources to devote to keeping them up to date. Uh, I mentioned it briefly early, but go and read Mark Baker's Every Page is Page One. If you can make it modular, if you can make it atomic, then you'll be able to grow quickly. I've worked on lots and lots of documentation suites that start small and grow rapidly. So if you have, yeah, Sarah, if you have Epo, if you have Every Page is Page One, you have uh, some form of Docs's code underpinning it, so it's easy to, oh, well done, mine's on, mine's on this shelf behind me, um, so I'm, I could probably get it pretty quickly. But um, yeah, definitely read every page, page one, definitely implement, I uh, read anything by, um, by Anne Gentle, who's, who's does the, has done the groundwork on, on Docs's code and make sure that it's, it's modular and you can, you can build out, definitely. So there's my book recommendations. I, I've never done a talk where I haven't given book recommendations. So there you go, two in one. All right, I'm going to limit us to one more question, and this question's pretty good, so I'll, I'll toss this one out. What are the metrics that you often use for measuring documentation improvement? We are actually just going through ours now and working out what we want to use. Um, I think it's different in everyone, in every project. I think it depends a huge amount on I mean, for starters, working in a startup is very different to working in an established company. I used to work for SUSE, which is, you know, one of the oldest software companies there is. And coming from there to a startup has been a, a real change. Now the focus is on signups and that kind of thing, whereas with SUSE, it was more about satisfying these customers that have been around a long time and gives a huge amount of money. Um, so that focus is very, very different depending on what your goals are. So always start by stating your goals. Uh, working out what it is that you want to achieve. If it's if it's more user signups, if it's people reading your docs for spending more time on your docs, if it's people going on social media and saying wonderful things about you, then the metrics that you're going to use will change. Um, we're getting we're getting a lot of information at the moment out of our top search terms. It's giving us a lot of feedback about the things that people find confusing about our product or find difficult. So we're, we're seeing the same search terms come up again and again. That gives us an immediate um, idea of which docs need to be improved and which docs we need to make sure we're keeping on top of, making sure they're accurate. Uh, we're also implementing stuff around the pipeline from support, which we didn't have previously, making sure that when customers are talking to support stuff, customers are coming to them a lot with, they can let us know, we can make sure we're improving the docs for that. So there's lots of different um, pathways that information is going to come to you. Awesome. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, thank you to Lana, especially for an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yes, let's all do jazz hands. And <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. So just for the record, in, in Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language, this is clapping. Oh, is it really? So yeah, so when, you, when you're when you on a Zoom call like this and you're on mute, doing this is a perfectly acceptable way to do this there in we go. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.